So in this third video, I um, examine further some of the um, discontentment in the international community with the um, underpinnings of the settlement that was reached at the end of World War II, codified in the UN Charter, which provided only for a very restricted um, set of situations in which the use of force could be regarded as legal, uh, namely self-defense and the restoration of international peace and security. Um, so in the last video, I mentioned uh, the responsibility to protect. And what I'll go on to do now is, is to discuss um, another major challenge, uh, really, to that kind of setup, which is the um, various consequences and ramifications of the so-called war on terrorism. And um, my, one of my um, uh, foundational documents in this is uh, the United States National Security Strategy published under the administration of George W. Bush in 2002, um, shortly after the declaration of the war on terrorism um, after the 9-11 attacks in New York and Washington. And um, it says some interesting things. Let's have a quick look. Um, and there's my, one of my favorite pictures of the aforementioned Bush. Um, anyway, um, it says one uh, fairly familiar thing, which is in building a balance of power that favors freedom, the U.S. is guided by the conviction that all nations have important responsibilities. Um, that is, you can't get away with uh, being an ally of Washington these days uh, without joining in with these so-called um, global security military operations. Now, the next bit is um, the famous or infamous part um, of this strategy, which is the doctrine of so-called preemptive self-defense. In other words, um, the provision for self-defense set out in the UN Charter was now insufficient in the era of international terrorism, this document argues, um, because, um, you know, why should a country such as the US wait to actually sustain an attack uh, before defending itself or seeking to defend itself if it knows full well that an attack is being planned why shouldn't it snuff that out before it happens so it says as a matter of common sense and self-defense america will act against such emerging threats before they are fully formed before they're fully formed and another significant paragraph um, set out uh, this um, claim that the single sustainable model for national success is the combination of free elections and free markets. So if you cross-reference those, it might seem as though countries um, that don't have free elections and free markets can be construed as threats, and those threats will be struck uh, before they are fully formed. Uh, and therein may lie one way, at least, of understanding uh, this policy which has been pursued with such alacrity in Washington over this period of regime change. Uh, because um, to various degrees, the regimes of Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad in Syria, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and others um, have um, differed from this single sustainable pathway to national success uh, in respect of either free elections or free markets or both. Um, so that's that. Um, but let's move on to consider, therefore, a question which uh, is nested within that, what is meant by terrorism? What is meant by terrorism? Well, here's a couple of definitions. Um, this, one, uh, this one is just a, a cartoon um, referring to the extraordinary number of Americans who, um, according to opinion polls, believed uh, by the eve of the, of the invasion of Iraq in 2003 that, um, in fact, Saddam Hussein had been responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Uh, it's what was called a national mind control experiment uh, by the psychologist Philip Zimbardo. Mommy, what happened to Osama bin Laden? No, honey, it's pronounced Saddam Hussein. So uh, that's that. Um, what is meant by terrorism? Well, here's one definition from the Pentagon. It's premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets by subnational groups subnational groups. So it can't be states that do terrorism, according to the Pentagon, whereas an older definition before the so-called war on terrorism started um, was commissioned, actually, by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime 
And I'll leave you to read it on the PowerPoints, but the essence of it is that um, it can include um, actions by states. And the aim of the actions is not merely against the proximate target, uh, but in fact, um, in order to send a message to a wider target. In other words, the target is chosen for its symbolic value as much as its actual value. And symbolic value presupposes that it will be a mediated event. Uh, it's not coincidence that our, um, I suppose, consummate image of terrorism is still um, that extraordinary picture of a plane uh, colliding with the World Trade Center in 2001. And of course, that occurred in a city um, where there was a very high chance that cameras would be trained on the event as it took place. Uh, and that's not coincidental. So there's some of the issues um, of the so-called war on terrorism. Um, and um, as you can imagine, um, those definitions kind of give rise to all sorts of, of, of difficulties. Um, but um, the um, other point, yeah, the other point is, um, yeah, the other point is that um, uh, the, the, the war on terrorism has disrupted the kind of categories that people had in mind at the end of the Second World War when those constraints were set. So therefore, um, of course, the rules apply to states. So for powerful non-state actors to be capable of, of such acts of kind of um, death and destruction um, was not necessarily something that fits the paradigm. Um, and the other point is that um, in terms of, of um, limiting uh, the conduct of war, that is how war can be fought, uh, of course, if you're taken prisoner, um, then you must either be a combatant, uh, a soldier, um, or a civilian. If you're a soldier, then you're entitled to the protections of the Geneva Conventions, and you should only be expected to give your name, rank, and serial number. Whereas if you're a civilian, you should uh, be able to expect to be assumed, presumed innocent uh, until proven guilty. And of course, the, the war on terrorism gave rise to this new category, the so-called enemy combatant, um, who is entitled to neither protection. So there's been a kind of um, category shifting, transgressive kind of force of this so-called war on terrorism uh, in, in both directions. Um, when it comes to implementing uh, the, the system of rules and regulations of the post-World War II settlement.